Today on Ask This Old House. Maker Jen Larges is back to show us how to cut a perfect circle with a router. So if you're going to make a cutting board, a stool, a round mirror frame, this type of technique is always going to give you a much better cut. If you live in an old house, you may have some ungrounded outlets. I'll explain what that means and show you how to fix them. I'll share some good techniques for using a paint roller. And uh, we're going to start at the bottom. Just go like on a little angle like that. Little angle. Little angle. And this fireplace screams 1980s, but simply changing out the doors will make a big difference. Thank you so much, Mark. You're welcome. Hi there, I'm Kevin O'Connor and welcome back to Ask This Old House. We have got a packed show for you today. Heath, our electrician, is going to be talking with a new homeowner with some electrical advice. Mara is going to be sharing some painting techniques and our Mason Mark is going to be installing some new fireplace doors. But first, our maker friend Jen Largest is here and she's got a brand new project. Hey Jen. Hey, how are you? All right, good to see you again. Thanks for coming back and working with us. Thank you for having me. And to continue sort of your mission, which is to kind of inspire people to get involved. Yeah, getting people starting to use tools for the first time or really challenging themselves with a new skill or new task. All right, so the tool of choice today is this one? Yeah, this is a router. It's not something that a lot of homeowners have in their toolkit, but if you're just starting out with woodworking, maybe you're building a first piece of furniture or uh, you're just moving into a new home because you're starting a family. Congratulations, so by the way. You. Your second one. We're yeah, excited for you. Very excited. But this isn't something that you would typically think to gravitate towards, but it's a really versatile tool and it has a lot of different applications. Great. So what do you want to make with it today? Well, I think most new homeowners would pick this up and use it to put a decorative edge on a DIY right. piece of furniture, but today we're going to be using it for a cutting application and we're going to use it to cut a perfect circle. Okay, let's do that. So the first thing we need to do is replace this plate, remove these screws. So now we can take this plate off and use it to trace on our board and mark the location of our holes. So I'm using a countersink drill bit so that the screws that go into the plate will sit nice and flush. All right, and so now that center hole will clear out with the spade bit so that our bit can clear the sawdust as we cut. So this is the board we're going to be cutting, and I just want to go ahead and check the width of the board, which is 11 and a quarter. And so just to be safe, I want to make sure the diameter of my circle is no more than, let's call it 10 which means the radius, or half that, can't be more than five. So I'm going to take that radius and put the five in the center of my hole where I know my bit will be. So now I can mark that on my jig, and that'll be my pivot point. Now we can attach our board to our router. Now I have our board secured to the table. I've screwed it down through all four corners and I'm going to go ahead and mark the center and just two lines cross corner to corner and then I'll use that as the point for my pivot point. Okay, so now I can line my nail up on the pivot point and lower the jig. I'm going to be using a nail instead of a screw so that it doesn't bind as I turn. So I have my bit set just below the surface of the board and I'm going to turn on the router and then plunge into a shallow cut. Now I can lower the bit and do another pass to complete the cut.
until you're through, right? Yeah. So now we can go ahead and just remove the nail and remove the router and jig. Mm -hmm. And I have a perfect circle. Look at that. So that is perfect and way more precise than if you went after it with a jigsaw. Very true. So if you're going to make something small like a cutting board, a stool, a round mirror frame, this is going to give you a much better application. You can also use it for larger applications if you wanted to cut out something like a round dining table. Right. This type of technique is always going to give you a much better cut. All right. Good information, Jen. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now you can watch This Old House and Ask This Old House anytime, anywhere. Download our new app to stream full episodes to your tablet, your TV, and your phone. Binge on classic episodes, catch up on recent renovations, and get step-by-step -step help projects all around the house. And best of all, it's free. The most trusted home improvement information is now available on your Amazon Fire TV, Roku, Apple TV, iOS, and Android devices. Download the This Old House streaming app today. Well, Heath, thanks a lot for coming by and helping me out. Thanks for having me. This house is 100 years old, but you can see they renovated the basement in the 1970s. Was the bar here, or is that something you built? This was my first home improvement project. This was the first project? Not painting, not anything else, the bar? I cleared it through the wife, so I knew I had to run with it. <laughs> Maybe if we finish up early, we can have a drink. It does look great. The problem is in here, on the unfinished side, we were going through the whole house with the home inspector, and um, he told us that this outlet was ungrounded. Okay. I've been kind of afraid to use it because honestly I don't know what that means. Sure. Um, so we can look at it right away and tell that it is an ungrounded receptacle and you can only two prongs. We have the hot and the neutral. We don't have any terminal for the ground wire. So I can kind of explain how all of this works and hopefully make it make sense a little bit more to you. When you call for power on a device, current is sent from the breaker in the electrical panel through the black wire, often referred to as the hot. The current will travel through the wire and into the appliance, giving it power. The used electrical current will then return back to the panel through the white or the neutral wire, thereby completing the circuit. For ease, these two wires are usually encased together in a jacket. When everything in the house is operating properly, there should be no issue with the flow of electricity. Technically, houses are powered with alternating current, so the current alternates back and forth as it distributes power. But for the sake of keeping the explanation simple, this is a general flow of electricity. Now if a fault occurs somewhere in the device or the receptacle, that electric current will travel where it's the easiest. If the device being powered is made out of metal, like many appliances, the whole thing has the chance of becoming electrified and can shock someone that touches it. To control fault current, code added the requirement of a grounding wire, which is usually just a bare copper wire that goes inside of the jacket with the hot and neutral wires. The bare copper is extremely conductive, so if there's ever a fault, the current will travel through the grounding wire back to the panel, and the surge of current will trip the breaker, cutting power from that device. All right, Colin, so we have a couple of solutions for this problem. Okay. So the easiest thing that we can do is we can leave the existing wiring as it is and install a ground fault circuit interrupting receptacle. How this works is it senses a certain amount of power coming in and a certain amount of power going back out. It wants to see the same amount. So let's say we have 10 amps coming in. It wants to see 10 amps coming back on the other side. If it sees 9.995 amps, something as small as 5 thousandths of an amp, this is designed to trip and give you an added layer of protection. It sees that power going somewhere else that it shouldn't, and that's why it trips. That's why we use them in something like a kitchen, outdoors. We don't know if the power is going to water, somewhere that it shouldn't be going. So we want to have this in place. The good thing is we have to have this in an unfinished basement if we're installing a receptacle anyway. So we have to put this here. The downside is we still don't have the equipment grounding conductor that I really want to have in this system. So what I'd prefer to do is since we have access to everything and it's a wide open basement in a short run, I'd really rather run a new cable with the equipment grounding conductor in it so everything is sized properly, everything is safe, clean and new. Sounds great. All right, Colin, now we're gonna turn that circuit off. We'll take the multimeter, plug that into the receptacle and let me know we don't have power. All set? All set. That's it, Heath. All right, perfect. Now that that's off, we can take that apart. 
Not only is that receptacle ungrounded, but over here behind the washing machine, this receptacle has a bunch of violations as well. I think the best thing to do is take both of these out and install a single new dedicated laundry circuit to make everything correct. All right, one down. That's that. So now we can mount the metal electrical box to the concrete wall. We've chosen an electrical metal box because we don't need additional lumber to mount this to the concrete. So this conduit coming down the wall is going to house the wire coming down to our electrical box. We have to put a slight bend in this conduit in order to fit in the box. Since this is a standard connection size, they actually make a conduit bending tool that will let us bend this conduit to the exact size that we need. Since this receptacle is going to be used for a laundry circuit, we want to make sure we run a 12 gauge wire because it is code and it can handle a heavier load. We want to make sure that we turn the power off at the main breaker. That way when we take the panel cover off, there are no energized parts inside. We're going to use an arc fault breaker with a hot and the neutral tied to the breaker the white pigtail will tie to the neutral bar, and the ground we've just installed will tie to the grounding bar. All right, we're just going to plug this last machine in. That's all powered on. You're all set. That looks awesome. Thank you so much for the explanation. Well, thanks for having me. It's Functional. a much safer install. Should be happy. Perfect. Do you have time for a cold drink? Yeah, let's go take a look at that bar you built. All right. I think you've earned it. Always five o'clock somewhere, right? <laughs> Hopefully. So if you have an outlet, um, a receptacle that looks like this with two prongs, you right. know that is ungrounded. No ground. If you see one with three prongs, is it grounded? Not always the case, and that's why you want to grab a little tester like this. For six or seven dollars at your home center, you can pick one of these up, and it can kind of tell you the situation you have going on inside that receptacle. Three prongs on one side, three lights on the other side, a little grid up there, and yep. so if I plug it in, I get one light in the middle, uh, that says open ground? What does right. that mean? It means it's the exact same situation as this. Even though they put a three-prong receptacle in, there's still no ground. No ground wire. They no just... ground wire. Hmm. They just did it to adapt to their device. Tricky. Okay. And if I put this one in here, two lights, that tells me hot, neutral, reversed? Right. So they're actually on the wrong terminals. They've swapped the black and the white wire are on opposite sides. But it's working, so what do I care about that? You care about that because if you have an appliance or a device plugged in, the on-off switch isn't really turning it on and off anymore. It's stopping the circuit from being complete, but power's still flowing through the system instead of stopping at the switch. Don't put your knife in the toaster. Do not put your knife in the toaster. Okay, and then the final one, two lights over here. Yeah. All good. That's what it should look like. Oh, all right, you just earned yourself another cold one. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Heath. Thanks. Want to tackle all your home improvement projects with confidence? Join This Old House Insider, a new streaming service from This Old House, the iconic Emmy-winning series that inspired a generation of home enthusiasts. Stream over 1,000 episodes of This Old House and Ask This Old House commercial free. Watch it all in the This Old House app and join live online Q&As with our experts. Best of all, you can try Insider free for seven days. To join, go to thisoldhousemembership.com. Hi, Mark. Hey, Kevin. What are we talking about today? Today we're talking about uh, paint rollers. Okay. Rollers are measured by the naps and the length of the fiber that makes up the rollers. So we've right? got three right We've got here. three samples here. Short, medium, large, and how do you measure them? Okay. This one of here is a quarter of an inch. Quarter inch nap. Okay. This one of here is three eighths mm -hmm. and one inch. Ooh, okay. That's thick. So different naps, I presume, for different types of surfaces? Different type of surface. Let's say we got this surface here. So you notice this is very nice and smooth. The proper roller for that is the quarter of an inch. Okay. Nice for this smooth surface. You will not edit any texture to it. Beautiful. And then as you move over here, there is some texture to this. You see, like the semi-rough surface. This one, the 3-8 roller nap will do the work for you. We'll get all the lower spot. We'll add a little bit of texture to it, yeah. but you won't see much because this 
it's already there. Gotcha. And then this is super rough. This is kind of that popcorn this look. This is the popcorn looks. A lot of texture in it. This guy here will do the work for you. This is one inch thick. Yeah. Okay. Then we get all the spots and we'll add a little bit of texture to it today also. But you don't see much because this is full of textures. It will blend in. So when I go to the store, I figure out what kind of surface I have in my house. When I go to the store, how do I pick the right roller? Obviously, look for the label. The label will oh, tell you. Uh, how thick the nap is and what kind of surface that is good for. Oh, nice. So this label will say quarter inch nap and for smooth surfaces? And smooth surface, absolutely. Was this quarter inch? This is quarter inch. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. All right, so now I get the right roller. Um, okay. Most importantly, though, from you, technique. Let's do it. What do you got for us? Okay, let's start with the 3 8 on this semi rough surface. Okay, I'm in. Roller cover on the actual roller. roller cover. We paint is poured. Paint, paint tray. Let's saturate the roller enough for the first pass. Yeah. And uh, we're going to start at the bottom. Just go like on a little angle like that. Little angle. Little angle. Because you don't want to leave any bro uh, roller marks on the surface here. So asymmetrical helps you. Absolutely. OK. You can see it actually going into those depressions. You can see like that everything with the roller 3 yeah. eighths get a good coverage right at the uh, the lower spots. Did there. not skip over any of that, just filled it in. Filled it in. Might not have gotten that with the quarter inch nap. It would be hard to cover the whole thing. Okay. So now you've got uh, an overlap a little bit. I noticed that the second pass you came over a few inches. Notice that I, I overlap, it's, I would say 30 to 50%. Okay, by design, that's what you want to do. By design, because once you get rid of the any roller marks, you can go all the way here, and then you can always go back yep. and make sure everything is nice and smooth. You don't see roller marks. You don't see any imperfections. If you miss anything, go back. And so I can always go back, but you've got this rule about, I think, what do you guys call it, wet to wet? You got to keep the wet edge. Wet edge. That's what you got to say. Yes. So you don't want anything to set up because you don't want to take a wet roller and go over something that's set up. Absolutely. So you don't start here and then in the middle decide to take a break. Don't do that because the paint will dry and it's going to be hard to fix that. Right. We're still wet, so you're fine with me going over that? Absolutely. Try Look that. at that. I went there right on the other one. What are you doing this surface here? Jimmy Cricket. <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> Very good. All right. Very helpful, Mauro. Know which, uh, which roller to pick and a little bit of technique. Thank you. So for every surface, you're going to have the right roller nap. And the right technique. Absolutely. So Mark, um, the ranch itself was built in the 1960s, but okay. as you can see, this room was clearly renovated in the right. 80s. I can see some track lighting, even the skylight kind of tells me 80s. Yeah. Um, when we purchased the house, there was just a flat front. Okay. Um, my grandfather helped us design and build this mantle right Which here. Which I think is great. But the doors definitely take away from that. Right. So as you can see, um, the doors themselves are pretty difficult to open. Um, they get stuck and you kind of have to wiggle them to get them to close. Okay. Um, the same goes for the screen. Well, all these problems are pretty typical with these doors. They were really put on the front of these fireplaces to help with the draft. Sometimes the air would build up outside and come down that flue and blow ash all over the living room. That's a problem. And the other problem is that it would steal heat from the room. So if the fire was dissipating, it would start to pull air from the room and you would lose heat. The doors definitely help to regulate the air so they could find a, a sweet spot and make it draft properly. Mm -hmm. Today, if you have a gas insert, that's what you're going to see is that glass door. So they're very typical for aesthetics these days as well. Um, but I see you have candles in there. You, are you guys burning wood? We do. During the winter time, we burn wood. But throughout the rest of the year, we like to have the candles going. OK, so I think we can make a big improvement over here. So why don't we get this door off and check it out? Great. All right. All right, so this door is only held in by a screw and a bolt, which I can undo right now. So if you want to hold that for me. Sure. I'll just take this screw out. I'll take the nut driver for this one. All right, that's done. OK, so the side's out. OK. All right, we'll just pop that out. So if you grab that side. Yep. 
Okay. All right, now it should just slip out. All right, nice. So pick her right up and let's walk it right out. All right, so there's the new door. How do you like it? They look really nice. Okay, so this one was a little bit odd because of the size of your opening. It's a little bit shorter here and a little bit longer here. So we actually had to have this door custom made. So this is 16 gauge steel. It's black powder coat paint and this is tempered glass and it's also on a trackless frame. Uh, the other great thing about this door is it's easy install. The last one we took out was just a couple screws. This one actually has four. So let's take this door off and we're gonna work on it when it's flat. Yep, right down. Okay. Watch the glass and then just drop it right down onto the styrofoam. So we're gonna put in two of the four straps before we install the door. Once we do that, it's gonna be very easy to find out where we have to drill on the inside. Find that hole in the strap, poke it through, go back to the brass, twist it a little, and then tighten her up with your screwdriver. Just make sure it's flat. All right, so just make sure you grab the glass and just flip it up. All right, just remember you have half inch of coverage, as do I. Okay. Now let's peel this tape off the doors. All right. Now we're gonna be able to open the door. Great. So just hold it into place, and I'm gonna lean over and do okay. that mark, and then you can lean over and do mine. All right, great. Let's get these doors out and then drill the holes. All right, Melanie, so I'm clamped in nice and tight. I just want to check level. That looks great. Now let's start and driving these screws in. All right, Melanie, what do you think? Wow, such a simple change makes a big transformation. Oh, I really love the way it looks. But after you go to bed, just make sure you keep the doors closed. That way you don't lose any heat up to the flu. But uh, other than that, keep adding logs and keep that fire roaring. Great, thank you so much, Mark. You're welcome. Thanks for watching. This old house has got a video for just about every home improvement project, so be sure to check out the others. And if you like what you see, click on the subscribe button. Make sure that you get our newest videos right in your feed.